Hey, good morning and welcome to Church Online. As we like to say at North Park, you made our day when you logged on. I want to remind you of two things very quickly before we get into our sermon today. And that is that we gather every Sunday at Riverbend Middle School in person at 10 a.m. And we would love for you to join us. The second thing is you can visit the Version Bible app and under live events, look for North Park Church. And there you'll find notes about today's scriptures, the verses we use, and also the main points of today's message. We are in week number four of our sermon series, The Road to Redemption. And we've been taking a close look at the life of Simon Peter and kind of the highs and lows of his life and how that relates to our life and what impact Jesus has on that life. And so if you would join me in the scriptures in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 19. So grab your tablet, grab your cup of coffee, and let's get into God's Word together. What's up, North Park? We're so glad you guys are joining us online this Sunday. We just want to invite you guys to worship our God and glorify Him for who He is. You guys ready? Come on.
So to kind of have some context today of our message, I want to read kind of a little introduction uh, that will help us get grounded in the context of this scripture. Uh, N.T. Wright says that many Jews during Jesus' day believed that God would send an anointed king who would be the, the spearhead of the movement that would free Israel from oppression and bring justice and peace to the world at last. Everyone was looking in the Jewish community for this Messiah, this anointed one who would overthrow Rome, who would bring God's peace to the world. And they were looking with, with just great excitement. And many times they thought they had found that person. In fact, historically, we know that, that other people came and, and before Jesus and claimed to be the Messiah, and some even after Jesus. And the problem was eventually they would get arrested, and eventually they died. And when they died, their movement was over. And so we have this, this excitement, this anticipation, looking toward a Messiah. Now, what made that really dangerous is the Romans knew that the Jews were hoping for this anointed one who would be the true king of the Jews and who would actually overthrow their oppressive rule. And so it wasn't just the Jews that knew about this. The Romans knew about it as well, which meant the moment you called yourself Messiah or your followers referred to you as such— you were in major danger. You were risking your life every single moment. And so to kind of set the stage where we're at, that's kind of the background of what's happening. Jesus has been busy in ministry, and now he pulls his disciples aside. Um, they spent a lot of time at the Sea of Galilee. Now he takes them 25 miles away, which would be about a two-day walk away from kind of all of the people and a lot of the Jewish people to an area that was called Caesarea Philippi that did not have a lot of Jewish people there. And he gets them alone, but he takes them to this place, and we're going to see in a moment, for a very specific reason. So let's look in verse 13. It says, Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Okay, so he's asking, who do people say that I am? But that, that area that they're at, the Caesarea Philippi, had a lot of history. In fact, it goes back to the Old Testament as a place where people worshiped the god Baal, and, and they would even perform sacrifices there, sometimes child sacrifices. And so it had that history, but it also had a political history. Um, this particular place was a gift that Herod the Great was given by Caesar Augustus for his loyalty. So the Roman emperor gives this particular land to uh, Herod the Great. Now, Herod, in response to that, builds a temple. In fact, some say three temples as a place to worship Herod or worship Caesar even after his death as if he was God. So it becomes not just a religious place in the Old Testament, but in first century, it becomes a political place that's also a religious place. And then as time goes by, Herod the Great dies, his land is split up amongst his sons, and his son Herod Philip inherits this land. And he begins to remodel this area. He begins to to rebuild some of these places, and he renames it to have this name for Caesar and then tax his name Philip or Philippi on the end, and he, he kind of makes it about himself and Caesar. And so it's still very much a real political place that represents the power of Rome, but has this background of foreign religion all in one area. And Jesus, kind of, you can imagine him walking past that temple with the disciples, kind of in the background is this political statement that Caesar is Lord. That was a phrase they would use, that he has brought peace on earth, that he is king of kings, that he is Lord of lords. And Jesus says, so who do people say that I am? In verse 14, and they said to him, some say John the Baptist. That was a rumor going around at the time uh, because Herod, Phil Herod, Herod Philip's brother, uh, Herod Antipas had John the Baptist killed and was afraid that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected, that he had come back to life and was going to judge him. So some people were saying, well, maybe this is John the Baptist come back to life. Um, others say Elijah. Elijah was one who uh, was a forerunner of the Messiah to come. So people thought, okay, when, when Elijah shows back up on the scene, then we look for the Messiah. And that was really a compliment. John the Baptist and Elijah were really held in high esteem. And then the last was Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was this authoritative prophet, but a very emotional prophet. He's called the weeping prophet. 
And, and many times because of Jesus' great authority, but also because of his compassion for people, he was even weeping over God's people. Some thought he was Jeremiah. And all of these would have absolutely, for anybody else, been a compliment. But as we know, just saying that Jesus was a great prophet was falling short of the truth. And so we see in verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? All right, we know what culture is saying, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now that's a loaded statement. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That's basically just saying his formal name, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. What Jesus is saying is, this isn't something you just kind of figured out on your own. Yeah, you had some experiences, but, but God the Father has revealed this to you. He's stirred something in you. He's revealed to you the truth of my identity. But that statement he makes is huge. And remember, again, they're in the backdrop of all of this, this kind of political temple, this, this establishment that is dedicated to Rome. And the Christ is kind of a Greek New Testament word for an Old Testament word, Messiah, which means anointed one. And it's a very dangerous political term. It's saying that Jesus is the true king, not only just of the Jews, but really of the world. And he has come to make things right. And when he says son of the living God, right in the shadow of this temple to Rome, that was a title that was often given to Caesar. Caesar was the son of God. And, and, and Simon Peter says, that's who you are. You are the Christ. You're the one we've all been waiting for. You're the one we're ready to follow. You're the one that's going to change history. You are the son of God. In verse 18, and Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell. hell sorry, I went real country there, hail, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's another really loaded statement. In fact, it has huge influence on history and how we view things in the church today. Now, there's a big argument here, and, and, and it's without getting into all the details. Uh, basically, Jesus gives Simon Peter this new name. In fact, we read about it all the way back in John chapter 1. So this is not the first time that Jesus refers to, to Peter as the rock. So here's what it is. The name Peter in Aramaic is Cephas, and Cephas means rock or stone, okay? And this isn't the first time that Jesus uses this. As we said, in John chapter 1, he says, you are Simon, son of John, you shall be called Cephas or the rock. You shall be called that. But here, he makes this statement, you are Cephas, you are this rock, and so he goes from saying you will be to you are. What changed is Simon Peter's confession that Jesus is Lord. That confession began to mold Simon Peter and his ministry and his life from here on out, that foundational truth. Now, here's where things get interesting kind of in church history. Um, depending on your background, some believe that this is a statement, and, and typically the Roman Catholic Church believes this is a statement saying that the rock is Simon Peter, and the church is built on him, and he is the first pope, and everybody after him kind of succeeds from him, and it was all built on him. Um, but, but there's something going on here with the words. There's a masculine and a feminine, feminine pronoun here, or a noun, when it comes to the Greek for Peter's name. And then when Jesus says, and on this rock, he changes the Greek a bit to let us know. He's saying, yeah, you're this rock, but upon this rock, upon something bigger, I'm going to build the church. And we've got three options. The first one is Jesus is building his church on himself. The second one is Jesus is building the church on Simon Peter. Or the third option is Jesus is building the church on Peter's confession. And, and most believe that Jesus is saying he is, this confession is true, that the church that Jesus will build is on himself, on the rock. He will build his church on himself. This confession is true. So Simon Peter is not in some way more, uh, is, is not 
in some way more gifted or special or somehow ahead of all the other apostles. Yes, he was a leader. Yes, he was one that would speak out. Yes, he did many great things and was used by God. But um, traditionally, our church does not take it to mean the same way as the Roman Catholic Church. It's just kind of a, a difference of translation. And what it really comes down to for us is in 1 um, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, it says this, For no one can lay the foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And even Simon Peter will write his own letter and say that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. So the cornerstone of the church is Jesus Christ. Now, here's what's interesting about this. And and again, this will sound super technical, but it it really shows how we, we can somehow miss what Jesus is saying. Jesus uses the term for church is ekklesia. And ekklesia, as you've probably heard thousands of times, is the Greek word that we use for church. But this word has a deep history. In fact, it was not originally a religious term at all. Here's what it simply meant. It meant a gathering of people called out for a specific purpose. A gathering of people called out for a specific purpose. So a group of soldiers could be an ecclesia. They were a group of people that were called out for a particular mission or purpose. It could be people that were just performing civic duty that were called out for a specific purpose. And that's what the term meant. Now, in the Old Testament, it is also used to refer to Israel as being a called out people for a specific purpose. And, and so whether you look at, 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 at you know, religious um, use of the word historically, it always meant a called out people for a specific purpose. If you look at just kind of secular history, it, it meant a called out people for a specific purpose. And that's what Jesus is saying here. But as time went on, in fact, about 250 years after this moment that Jesus says these words, a Roman emperor named Constantine becomes a believer. And with that, when the most powerful person in Rome becomes a Christian, other Roman elite people who wanted to merit favor with him became Christians as well. And and Christianity was this very informal group of people that would meet like a family and gather for a meal and sing songs and gather in homes. They didn't have official buildings. Well, for the Roman elite, this would not do. And so they said, we've got to have a building. And so they began to build buildings, sometimes near uh, Christians who had died their graves, these famous martyrs. They would build these large buildings that they actually had a word for. They called it a basilica. And that was a place of worship. It was a formal building for worship. Well, as history goes on, you know that Germanic cultures had a huge influence on language and on people after the Roman Empire, and they took this word basilica and had their own word, which meant house of the Lord. And unfortunately, this Germanic term for house of the Lord became the one most used often to refer to ecclesia of what Jesus meant. So here's what happens. The church was no longer a gathering of people called out for a specific purpose, The church became the building that people met in. And so you can see how it's changed the way we view things. That's a church. That's a building. The church is when people are there together on Sunday. And what Jesus said he was starting was a group of people who were called out for a very specific purpose. It wasn't an event or something you did on Sunday. It was whenever people were gathered around the purposes of Jesus Christ to build his kingdom, that was the church. He makes another statement and he says, and the gates of hell. Now, this is pretty interesting because not only was Sisera Philippi a place where they had worshiped Baal in the Old Testament, And not only was it a political place where now um, Herod had made this kind of a shrine to this political empire of Rome, but it also during this time in the first century when Jesus was speaking was a place where pagans or or non-Jews, non-Christians would gather to worship the god Pan, the god of nature. And here's what they believed. There was this cave in Sisera Philippi that had water that would flow into it. And they believed that this water would flow, this spring, this area, was actually the gate to the underworld. And the belief was that these gods, especially Pan, would go during the winter and hide in the underworld. And then he would come out in the spring and and they would want to celebrate him. And so they literally called this the gates to the underworld or the gates to Hades or what we might call the gates of hell. 
And there was this belief that you would have to kind of celebrate and do things to conjure him to come out. And so, so these Greeks would gather and, and, and just kind of a ceremony of prostitution and other really terrible things would take place in an effort to get the God of Pan to come out and bless them. And it was referred to as the gates of hell. And so Jesus takes the disciples on a two-day journey, a field trip, to a place that has so much history of, of, of violence, of, of sexual sin, but also of the empire, of all this power, of all these other people saying, well, it's the God of Pan, or no, it's Baal, or no, it's Caesar Augustus, or, or, or no, it's, it's Rome itself. And Jesus uses this as backdrop. And he says, what happens here cannot stop what will happen when my ecclesia, when my people gathered and called out for a specific purpose, when they take my message of the gospel, nothing can stop it. And so in verse 19, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, again, this is another passage that taken out of context, people thought, okay, if the church was built on Peter, then Peter had these keys, and then Peter had kind of this idea of whose sins were forgiven and who were not, or who was allowed in and who was out, and, and, it, and it's led to this idea of Simon Peter, you know, we see the cartoons of him being at the gate as if he had elevated authority over the other apostles. But this term of the keys of the kingdom of heaven was the idea that keys were a sign of authority that were trusted to a steward by his master. And the, the master would give these keys and the steward would have the ability to use their possessions that belong to the master, but use them accordingly to the master's wishes. Meaning the keys were a way that a master would say to his steward, hey, here's my stuff, but I want you to steward my stuff and use it the way I tell you to and the way that I want. So this is about stewardship, not lordship. He is not saying, Simon Peter, you're in charge now. He's saying that this ecclesia, this church, this gathered people, everything that I have, I am stewarding to them my power, my influence, my word, and they are going to go out with that power and do mighty things. That idea of, of binding and loosing was when a rabbi would forbid something or permit something. It's, it's this thought of authority. Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out as a gathered people with my authority and what you're going to do, no empire or no, no gates of hell can come against it. And so very quickly and just, just to be practical, here's two things of how this passage affected the church and should affect us at North Park Church. The first thing is, is it, is it gets rid of a myth that Larry Osborne calls the holy man myth. Now, I want to be very clear that pastors and teachers, Scripture says clearly, will be held to a, a higher standard and, and, and give account for their words. But somehow we've gotten this idea that pastors somehow have a more direct line to God. And that's simply not true. Being held accountable for your words is one thing in your teaching and how you lead. That's stewardship. But what we see here is this idea has crept into the church that somehow the pastor or the person speaking is the one that really can understand scripture and God can really speak through him. And, and I really need him to pray or her to pray because they're different. But the reality we know is that, that pastors do not have a more direct line to God than anyone else who calls Jesus Lord. And here's why that's dangerous. It underutilizes the gifts of everyone else. In our church right now, there are people with gifts not using their gifts because they believe that they're somehow kind of the, the JV squad of Christians, that somehow pastors or ministry leaders have a more direct line. And the truth is, every follower of Christ has the privilege of direct access to God. We see this when Jesus dies, he takes his final breath, this curtain, this, there was a curtain literally in the temple that is torn in half. And, and it used to be that, that curtain kind of kept people out of the presence of God. And there was one special man, this high priest on a certain day that could do certain things to enter God's presence. And Jesus' death rips that in two. And now everyone, because of Jesus, has access to God. So it's a myth to say that somehow this pastor or this speaker or this person has a more direct line to God. The second thing it does 
is this passage gets rid of the idea of, of, of the, the holy place myth. And, and, and here's what that looks like. It's the idea that God's presence is somehow greater in some places than in others, that God is limited to be in certain places. So we believe that some places are places where God hangs out and there's other places where God has never been. And so where we see that played out is there are things we would never say in a church building that we would say somewhere else. And though you don't think that's a very big deal, here's what it reveals. It reveals that we think certain places are holy, and that's where God is, and other places are not, and God is not there. But this understanding is that the church is a group of people called out for a particular purpose means this, that God is at work in office buildings, apartment complexes, and living rooms. We have to get away from the the, the myth of one holy man or one holy place and understand that we, the church, the ecclesia, are called for a particular purpose, called out and on the move to do things for God. And the last thing that I want to point out is when he says the gates of hell. Growing up, I always thought that it was the idea that when hell attacked us, when the enemy attacked us, it would not win. But when you look at this, here's what we know. Gates were defensive structures in the ancient world. By saying the gates of hell would not overcome suggests that Jesus is saying those gates were actually going to be attacked. And and we've talked about this before, that spiritual warfare is a real thing. But again, we normally kind of present it in this way, that the enemy is always attacking us and that the victory of the Christian life is measured in terms of our ability to just resist it. If I just survive his attacks, then I'm living a victorious life. Life, But actually what we see here is that it's our ability not just to not do wrong, but it's our ability to do right. It's this question. As a church, North Park Church, what do we want to be known for? And I love this quote by uh, Jeff Henderson. He says, many people are familiar with what the church is against. We want to be known what we are for. Meaning if at your work, people know you're a Christian, they'll say, well, you must not do these certain things. And they might be careful in how they behave. And, and even in news media, and many times we don't make it easy on ourselves through social media, through our interactions with the world, we're constantly saying, here's what we're not for. Here's what we're against, against, against. But what is it that we're for? Because it's one thing to be against certain things, and we should. There are things that do not line up, but there is so much that we are for. We have to stop thinking about always being on defense. And what does it look like to be on offense? What does it look like to spread the kingdom and to attack the gates of hell to take back the things that are God? And and, then here's what we know. We are for people at North Park Church. We are for schools and we are for businesses and we want to see our community and city thrive. And the reason we want that is because God is for our community. And here's, I love this quote, something very powerful happens when the people who've said no to the church realizes the church has still said yes to them. There are people that have said no to church, but what happens when they realize the church still says yes to them? So just imagine with me for just a moment, what would it look like if if North Park Church started being for other churches? Meaning, what if we decided we wanted other churches to win? We wanted to celebrate what other churches are doing and not compete with them, but celebrate and genuinely be happy for the success of other churches in our area. What would it look like at North Park Church if we were four families? And what that means is, what if we started caring about families that are hurting, even if they do not and will never attend our church? What does it look like to be for our neighborhoods? Um, well, how do we show respect and care and love and that we want them to win in life? That's why we do things like the mobile food market twice a month on Wednesdays. You have the opportunity to go and serve neighborhoods. What does it look like to say we're for our teachers in schools? I read this this week and this blew my mind. The average teacher will have 1,200 hours of influence with one student. If we want kids and teenagers in our community to win, we have to be willing to help teachers and schools in this community win. Here's the big takeaway. God has blessed North Park Church with extraordinary potential. Therefore, we need to be for people because we want to reach people. We are going to say yes to them 
by showing we are here for them. That does not mean that we accept and agree with beliefs of other people, but it does mean that we love them. It does mean that we understand them. It does mean that we take time to listen to them. It does mean that we are for them. And we want to see families and neighborhoods and schools and leaders thrive. We are for our city. And what we are called to do when we are the ecclesia, the called out people for a specific purpose, what we are going to do, the gates of hell cannot stop. We are going after our city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you are for people, that you are for our community, that you are for our city. Lord, we want to be here for other churches and for our neighbors and for our teachers, Lord, and for our local businesses. Help us, Lord, to be a called out people in apartments, in office buildings, in living rooms, wherever we find ourselves, and the gates of hell will not prevail. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and thank you for joining us for Church Online.